I'm going to share briefly the screen. Um, okay, so so I have to that. take care that I mute myself when I am. Uh, yeah, I, I can I also was... mute you guys afterwards. So you don't, if you, if you don't remember. No, please after. do that, right? But then we have to raise our hand to, uh, oh, can I unmute myself then? You can mute yourself and then uh, I can mute. But I can also, if you mute me, can I unmute myself? Yes, you can on any time. But if you okay, misbehave, the... I can kick you out altogether. So okay. you should behave still. <laughs> you still have to behave. Uh, I don't know if the, uh, Matthias is still around. Sometimes Matthias comes us on the second. Matthias. Oh, there he is. Hang on. Let me get the, the other partner in crime here. And then Karen. Karen cannot join us because he's another meeting with Duisburg. So. Oh, there's Matthias. Okay, there's Matthias. Hi, you. Um, so, you. okay. Um, yes. So, let me uh, begin. Um, uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, welcome, Joss, uh, to join us. Uh, so as everybody uh, is familiar, uh, this is the online SPICE SPIN Plus X seminar. This is organized by the SPIN Phenomenon and Interdisciplinary Center, myself and Karen Eversor City lead, um, and in collaboration with the uh, Collaboration Research Center, led by Martin Ashleman, uh, Burger Hillebrands, and Matthias Chloe uh, in Mainz and Kaiserslautern. Uh, this is a webinar format, meaning that uh, you will be listening to the talk and you can write down your Q&A after uh, in the Q&A uh, uh, part of the, of the webinar. And then later on, I will give you the microphone to be able to ask the questions and raise your hands and I'll give you the microphone. Um, and again, please uh, check the, uh, the, uh, the schedule. We have a very nice, exciting schedule coming up. Uh, Oleg uh, Sershenikov next week. Uh, Claudia Felser, Oleg Monai, and Theo Rice uh, following this, this uh, talk. Um, just a short introduction to Jos Hermans. He is a premier uh, spin caloritronics person and also caloritronics uh, uh, in general a researcher. Um, uh, he's now a high em eminent scholar and professor in the high state for some time. Uh, and he is again known for, for all his very, very careful uh, heat uh, transport uh, in, in magnetic systems now in particular. Uh, has many, many honors. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the uh, AAA Society and fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, so with this short introduction, I'll stop sharing and I'll ask uh, Joss to please uh, share your screen. Yes, here we go. And also share, right? Yeah. Uh, go ahead and start it. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and start. Oh. Everything works fine. And let's see if I can put my uh, pointer on laser pointer. There we go. All right. So I'm going to talk about thermal conductivity and thermal properties uh, of wild semi-metals in, and uh, the influence of chirality, at least. This is what I'm going to try to convince you. We see in our data. The work is done by my graduate student, Zung Wu. Uh, we work with our theory friends, Nandini Trivedi and her group, Michael Flatte and uh, Jeanette Sahin, who is uh, with him. And uh, the funding is for an NSF Materials Research Society at Ohio State called the Center for Emerging Materials. <clears throat> so this is National Science Foundation funding. Let me start with a little bit of introduction as to why I'm really interested in heat transport and that is, here, this man, which we all know the name of Fouillet, but I challenge you to find his first name. He has, uh, like all French of the in, uh, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, 17 first names. Um, and he says, a little bit pedantically, I guess, that heat, like gravity, permeates all parts of the universe, which is, in fact, really true. Um, it implies that thermal transport can be measured on quasi-particles that don't have charge or spin, but it also implies that heat goes everywhere and the measurements have their own challenges because of that. So um, the structure of this talk, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to wild semi-metals, but given the nature of the seminar is I'm assuming that most of you know this. Um, also a brief introduction to the chiral anomaly, which is an anomalous conductivity, electrical conductivity. And what we think is it's thermal equivalent. 
and try to explain this to you. I will briefly go uh, over the experimental difficulties uh, that we encounter. I will introduce you to a semicon semiconductor topological insulator and while seen a metal system that you may not be so terribly familiar with, but it's really extremely good. It's the bismuth antimony alloy system. So these are narrow gap semiconductors and they can be prepared with exquisite purity and they can be frozen out. In other words, we can get rid of most electrons except the thermally driven ones, thermally excited ones. Uh, the main bulk of my talk is experimental evidence for anomaly in the thermal conductivity. I will show you that this is robust to phonons, robust to defects, so we would like to see this as being topologically protected, but I'll show you data and it's up to you to judge. I'll show you that we think the decay of what we observe with temperature is really only by inter wild point scattering, by thermal excitation from one, point, one wild point to the other wild point, and not by an interaction with uh, phonons or impurities. And then, then here comes the hardest part of the whole experiment, verifying the wiedemann franz law. So really, um, I should say that the thermal measurements took less than a year, about a year, but not that much. The wiedemann franz law took uh, close to 18 months to verify. <clears throat> if time permits, but I don't think it will. We also have data on thermal hall effects in these systems, but I don't think there will be space uh, in this talk to go over that. So very quick introduction to the three-dimensional topological solids. The dispersions of the electrons in them are linear dispersions. So there's only a Fermi velocity and a K vector. Um, these, the wild cones, which are characterized by these dispersions in 3D, come in pairs, pairs with opposite chirality. Um, we will be working with the chemical potential really very, very close to the wild point. The chemical potential will be much smaller than the temperature and smaller than the bandwidth of the wilds. So the wild bands have a certain amount of, uh, let's say, overlap here. And once we get at temperatures so that carriers can be excited from one valley to the other, then of course the phenomena disappear. But most of the time we will work in a KT region where we have thermally excited electrons and holes of uh, the same amount or nearly the same amount. Um, because of this linear dispersion, we of course do not have the concept of effective mass or really the concept of mobility. We have electrons have a chirality, they have a Berry phase and because of their Berry phase in the equations of motion, they develop an anomalous velocity, which would show up of course in the transport properties. We hope to prove that. Now, um, the most of the data, almost all the data that I will talk about, are taken in the extreme quantum limit. Uh, so here are our two overlapping bands in the conventional wild semi-metal. We actually never get there. And uh, then the applied magnetic field uh, opens the Landau levels in this system. Uh, the last Landau level is uh, chiral. Because of the chirality, the last Landau level in one of the wild points has only one slope in velocity. So these electrons here can only move to the right. And this has one slope, the opposite slope, so the electrons here can only move to the left. We will have right movers and left movers, and their existence is a result of the chirality of the electrons at these points. Now, <clears throat> and then here is something that's actually quite well known. It's been around for many decades and it's been shown to exist in many systems. It is the chiral anomaly. So if we apply an electric field parallel to the magnetic field and parallel to the direction that separates the wild points, then in the classic picture, of course, the electric field shifts the uh, electron dispersion toward one direction and uh, shifts this one also toward the same direction. But because these dispersions are linear, instead of showing this as a shift in K space, we can show this as a change in energy so that it looks as if the energy on the right movers, the chemical potential of the right movers went up, the chemical potentials of the left movers went down. That creates a difference in chemical potential, which also creates a different in, difference in population numbers. We have essentially generated right movers 
and annihilated leftovers by applying this electric field parallel to the uh, magnetic field. And so that gives rise to an anomalous current, which is proportional to the density of states in two dimensions, the Fermi velocity at thermodynamic steady state, not equilibrium, but steady state. This acceleration due to the electric field is balanced by a scattering back. So the resurrection time that comes in here, and then it's proportional to E dot B, uh, which means that the electrical conductivity, the anomalous electrical conductivity uh, is given by these things. And because we have one over the magnetic length in the bottom in the denominator, so we have something proportional to the magnetic field, uh, this gives a negative magnetic resistance. This scattering time, tau, is in this very simplistic model, but which we think we will see apply, is in fact the time with which electrons in the right moving pocket moves to the left moving pocket. So it should be the interwild point scattering time. All right, so now there are many publications where they solve the Boltzmann transport equation for E parallel B. And in a very simple Boltzmann picture, we have this exchange in carrier concentration between right movers and left movers that's given by the chirality plus minus one, this tau B dot E, and this is simply a Fermi integral. People also have added a temperature gradient to this uh, Boltzmann equation, giving us then a second term, which is grad T over T B dot times C1, which is another Fermi integral. If we have an ideal wild semi-metal, which is to say we put the chemical potentials at the wild points, which I will hope to prove you that we can do, then the C0 becomes one, the C1 becomes zero. So the thermal gradient has no effect on the distribution of carriers between the, pl the uh, chi equals plus one and chi equals minus one wild points. And we only have a change in carrier concentration, generation and annihilation of right movers, left movers respectively. So we only have an anomalous electrical conductivity that's given by the equation I showed you before. So what happens with this thermal field? If we put a temperature gradient, temperature gradient is not, of course, applied in K space, it's applied in real space. So we have the hot side of the sample where we have a soft, softer Fermi distribution at the same at both uh, wild points. And we have the cold side of the sample where we have a hard distribution on the uh, hot side on, the, on both wild points. So you see here, in principle, there's no change in delta n, and that's what the equation above uh, illustrates. Uh, however, let's go back to this transport equation, but instead of looking at the change in carrier concentration, we're going to look at the change in carrier energy. And the change in carrier energy has also a B dot E term, so the electric field can do that, multiplied by a couple of Fermi integrals, and a grad T can do that as well, multiplied by another couple of Fermi integrals. If we now do this in the ideal wild semi-metal, mu equals zero, then C1, C0 is one, but mu C0 is still zero. This is zero, this is zero, this is zero, but C2 is not zero. That Fermi integral in, in hard statistics becomes pi square over three times KBT. So what we have now is no change in carrier concentration between the left and the right movers, but a change in energy that is proportional to B dot grad T and is given by pretty much the same type of uh, parameters, the interwild point scattering time. And so that we can take a look now at an anomalous thermal conductivity, which has pretty much the same form as the anomalous electrical conductivity is proportional to the magnetic field applied parallel to the temperature gradient. To summarize, electric field only in an ideal wild semi-metal. Electric field only gives you a term that's proportional to B dot E, but no change in energy. And a thermal gradient only gives a term that's B dot grad T, but no change in carrier concentration. So we're going to look particularly at this term in our experiment. Uh, by the way, the ratio of the two you know, uh, extra energy over extra carrier concentration actually follows the Wiedemann-Franz law. 
uh, with the free electron Lorentz ratio if we take these scattering times to be the same. In other words, if there is only one scattering time in the problem, and that is the intervile point scattering. Of course, if the thermal scattering time, inelastic scattering time, were different from the scattering time for, uh, for charge transport, then we would have a different situation. But if they are the same, then you end up with a free electron Lorentz ratio. By the way, this only holds if the chemical potential is at zero. So in other systems than the one I will talk about, you have a trivial pockets and you have the chemical potential somewhere in one of the wild bands. This does not hold. This strictly holds for an ideal wild semi-metal. All right. So let's then, why does this not move now? Um, yeah, let me go a little bit over the difficulties with the experiments. And I will start with the problems in measurements of magnetoresistance. While semi-metals typically are materials that have very, very high mobilities, a million is not unused, and, uh, is, is very easily obtained in these materials at low temperature. Well, that means that the Lorentz force has a strong grip on these carriers. And if you have a situation where your current injecting electrodes on your sample are here and here, uh, well, of course, in uh, low magnetic fields, the current distributes itself through the sample, but you apply a magnetic field uh, parallel to the current that does tend to concentrate the electrons on a helical path in the middle of the sample. So the current distribution stops being uniform through the cross section of the sample, it concentrates in the middle. And if you have voltage electrodes here, the voltage electrodes are placed at a location where there is no current. So the voltage goes very small, and that to you would look like a negative magnetoresistance. It isn't. It's not a magnetoresistivity, it's just a magnetoresistance, but it's a macroscopic effect due to the distortions of the current lines. That is called current jetting, and it's been treated at length. Uh, by several of uh, our co-workers, uh, by several colleagues, uh, including here. Uh, we know how to avoid this. We have to make long-term samples and put the electrodes on the top. <clears throat> uh, it was a lesson that took a few years to learn, but we know how to do it. Now, another problem, which we are going to run into at, at length, and I will come back to this and probably spend 10 minutes on it, at, at close to the part of my talk where I verified the Wiener Franz law, is the geometrical magnetoresistance. So, in contrast to the previous uh, drawing where we had the field parallel to the current, uh, we are going to consider the case where we had the field perpendicular to the plane of the view graph here, perpendicular to the current. Not, of course, that we do this on purpose, but samples when they get mounted are always mounted with a very tiny misalignment, which is a critical parameter in our problem. Well, if that is the case, then the Lorentz force distorts the current lines a little bit like shown here, which as you can see, lengthens the current lines and creates a positive magnetoresistance, a parasitic geometrical positive magnetoresistance. Um, if we had an infinitely long, uh, uh, infinitely wide, I should say, and very narrow sample, that geometrical magnetoresistance would be proportional one plus mobility square field square, which would mean uh, that if we had, for example, in our samples, one degree of misalignment of the field, if there were one degree of the field that comes out of the, the plane of the drawing here, uh, that would give us, uh, with a, a million mobility, 200% positive magnetoresistance, which swamps out all the data. Uh, so this is a very serious problem that has to be taken into account, again, by looking at the geometries and at the misalignments of the sample. The good news is in thermal measurements, uh, the situation is much less dire. Uh, first of all, we have no electrical contacts, so we have no circulating currents. There's no Lorentz, macroscopic Lorentz force or macroscopic current lines. Of course, there still is a Lorentz force on the carriers themselves. But the thermal conductivity also has both a lattice and an electronic contribution. And the lattice contribution, when it is large enough, say half of the measurement, uh, that's good enough to redistribute the heat, dis to redistribute the heat. In other words, the lattice contribution in a picture like this would be able to short circuit these current lines in the vertical direction. 
question and straighten them out again. So that the problems with misalignments and sample geometry and all problems that are due to current line distortions are much weaker, much smaller in thermal measurements than they are in electrical measurements. And frankly, this makes the thermal measurements much more reliable and much easier. And I will show you how much more reproducible they are, whereas the electrical measurements are not. They take tremendous care. All right, um, the next part of my talk I need to introduce the material system, which uh, assuming that you're not terribly familiar with it, <clears throat> and that is the bismuth antimony semiconducting system. So we all know since, uh, well, since the 1960s, that bismuth is a conventional semi-metal. It has electrons at pockets at the L points of the Brewer zone. It has holes at the T points of the Brewer zone. If we look at the dispersion, there is an electron band here and a hole band here, and there is an overlap, so there's as many holes as there are electrons. Under this electron band is a second valence band, 13 millivolt deeper. And uh, so we, this is the anti-symmetric orbitals, and this is the symmetric orbitals of the sp hybridized electrons that constitute these uh, bands. Um, so the chemical potential is in between the T-hole band and the L-point electron band. Add now antimony, which we do on this axis. As you add antimony to this system, the lattice constant changes, it gets a little bit smaller. Of course, the chemical, put, the uh, Pauling uh, electronegativities of bismuth antimony are quite similar, but still uh, the spin orbit interactions decrease a little bit, but not that much. <clears throat> and so basically what happens is the two L point bands flip so that the anti-symmetric goes here and the symmetric band goes here. Uh, of course, that means that in between the two, there is a Dirac point here. Now the T hole band, which is the trivial pocket, uh, comes down in energy. Um, unfortunately, at the point where the material has a Dirac point, there's still RT holes. So this is not a perfect Dirac semi-metal. This is still a quite conventional semi-metal with holes at T points and electrons at L points, although the L points have a Dirac dispersion. But if we increase the concentration a little bit higher, say 9% or so um, here, say 8% or so, the T holes cross and they're going to the gap and then eventually they come out of the gap on the other side. So here we have a very simple direct gap semiconductor. The gap is now 10 millivolt or so at this concentration, but it can be made very pure. And uh, it is by the way, a topological insulator with band inverted. In fact, it was the first topological insulator identified experimentally by ARPES. I will show you these data here. This was uh, Hassan and Kav back in uh, 2008. And here is the ARPES drawings of the surface states of these topological uh, bands in this antimony, <clears throat> 8812. So this is really a TI. The beauty of it is that it can be made insulating. It's a genuine topological insulator. There's no problem with making that insulating. Now, I should point out to you that when we apply magnetic field to this, um, the G factor, which is a G tensor now, can in certain directions of the field become very high so that the Zeeman splitting term can overwhelm the orbital energy splitting term, the orbital energy term with high magnetic fields, which means that the last Landau level can actually close the gap. This has been seen optically when the magnetic field was aligned with the binary direction, the 100 direction, but the crossing appears there at 10 Tesla. If we go with the magnetic field in the trigonal direction, the G factor becomes minus 75 or some such number. The orbital is not, the orbital energy is actually not that high. So that these two terms actually cross at a very low field of the order of one Tesla. And uh, we are then in the ultra quantum limit already at one Tesla in these alloys, extreme quantum limit. So if I look here at the magnetic field dependence of the band structure, uh, you will have conduction band edge and valence band edge at the L point here. They split into Landau levels, uh, but the last Landau level, orbital quantum number zero spin one half closes. And it closes at this critical field 
H sub C where you have a genuine Dirac point and beyond which the bands cross again, but now that they cross, they cross and form uh, wild points. So Nandini's student calculated the chiralities and integrated the chiralities over these two points and the integrals flip from plus minus to plus one to minus one. So these are genuine wind points as calculated. Um, there they are. I have here a little drawing. The C axis is here. The magnetic field is aligned with this C axis and the wild points essentially split along the direction of the magnetic field. There is little in plane component, but most of the splitting is along uh, the Z direction. And you end up then with pairs of Y points around L point. And uh, so that means it's six L points, it's uh, six half wild points. One is inside, the other is outside the brain zone. So we really have three pairs of wild points in this system as fields above one Tesla. Um, well, my camera has frozen. Let me try to see if I can do something about it. No, well, maybe not. So now is the time to give you the uh, thermal conductivity. Uh, we make these samples. Here we go. We make these samples in house. Um, the beauty of this material system is that bismuth and antimony are isoelectronic. They group five elements, both of them. So that if you have a slight problem with stoichiometry control, that does not affect your carrier concentration. We can be off by a fraction of 1% and we have still the ability to freeze these samples out uh, by lowering the temperature. Very unlike the situation in business selenite, this were not antimony but selenium, any excess atom of selenium would give you an excess electron, any uh, atom that's missing would be uh, giving you a hole, and your chemical potential would fluctuate all over your sample. Not so in the business antimony system. The full solid solutions can be prepared with exquisite purity if one is careful. And this not itself gives mobilities of 10 million. The samples we have give mobilities up to 2 million. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, we prepare them. We had some samples made by Sokralski, some samples made by a traveling molten zone method. Um, we, you have to purify the materials in house. You can't buy a material that's pure enough on the market really. Um, we measured six samples at X, X is 11% and then samples at 15 and 5%. I'll show you that in a minute. The uniformity is critical. It's nominally 1% over the whole length of the sample, which is like five centimeter. But over the sample that we measure, which is a millimeter cut out of the five centimeter, it's much better than 1%. And we have extremely low carrier concentrations. I will show you that in a minute. Uh, but first, let me show you the families of samples. So we're going to measure six samples at 8911, which is right here in topological insulator wild point regime, sample at 15%, which should give the same answer. And then a sample at 5%, which has uh, T-holes. So this is a system with, uh, uh, with trivial, uh, trivial pockets in its Fermi surface. And that's where we do not expect effects. Whereas these, we can get to the situation where we have ideal wild points. So this is the null experiment, if you wish. Um, here is one of the mobility uh, plots and very low field, mag uh, very low magnetic field measurements of the electron and hole populations. We see electron mobility start at 20,000 at room temperature, climb to 700,000. The sample actually flips sign here in the Hall effect and the holes show up here, but they are at the 10, 15 carrier concentration range and the mobility is here in the 2 million at 10 Kelvin. <clears throat> Uh, so these samples have the chemical potentials really at the at the, the wild points. Well, in this, they are semiconductors. So here the chemical potential is in the gap. And when they flip in the quantum limit to be wild semi-metals, the chemical potentials comes at the, the wild points. Um, we also have made other samples with very low mobility, 20,000 mobility, to contrast and to be able to quantify uh, the effect of defect scattering of our measurements. But these are the good samples. Now, let's start by measuring the thermal conductivity in the trickle direction, because that is the direction where the wild points separate, and that's the direction in which we will also apply the magnetic field. Uh, so let's measure thermal conductivity in zero field. 
as the black points here, this function of temperature. Now that thermal conductivity is due to an electronic part, which is what we're going to be studying for wild physics. And then there is a lattice part, which is very welcome here because we actually use it so that we can redistribute the current lines and we're not suffering from these extrinsic geometrical effects. But of course, in order to make measurements and calculations, we have to subtract this lattice part. So how do we do that? Well, we take the same sample, but instead of putting the field along the three direction, B3, we put the field transverse along the B2 direction. Then we create a large magnetoresistance. And so the thermal conductivity sites here, that is a sum at zero field, that is a sum of electron and, and phonon part. And then when we apply the magnetic field, we freeze the electrons out by the magnetoresistance, and we are left with only the phonon part. These are different temperatures. So, so basically, the phonon part is the limit for high field, to high transverse field of the thermal conductance. The total electron plus, uh, plus phonons is here, it's a zero field value, and the difference, and we say, is the electronic part. So we do that at various temperatures, and you see here the lattice, here the uh, electronic part, and I'll get back to the dashed line on the next few graphs. <clears throat> All right, this is for a couple of samples. It's 11% samples or 15% samples. Now, uh, let's go straight to the main data. So we now measure, we flip the field from bisect trace to binary direct, to tracheal direction, B3, longitudinal thermal conduct, magnetothermal conductivity. And we do this on the sample at 5%, which has trivial pockets, and the sample at 11%, which doesn't, and the sample at 15%, which doesn't. It is immediately striking that the samples that don't have trivial pockets have this very large increase in thermal conductivity that you don't see at 16 Kelvin because of course there the thermal conductivity is completely dominated by the lattice, but it appears around 35 Kelvin or of the other of that, and it's actually really maximum in the 40 to 120, 140 Kelvin range. It's still there at 160 Kelvin. There's still even a hint of this positive uh, thermal conduction um, at 200 Kelvin. <clears throat> Same thing in the 15% sample. Uh, but then uh, let's go into what we think is going on here. So I can uh, then subtract the lattice thermal conductivity from the raw data and look at the change induced by a magnetic field on the electronic part only. And you see that change is actually spectacular. It goes from 0.5 to 1.8, 0.6 to 1.8. So this is a 300% change in thermal conduction in kappa E, electronic thermal conduction with magnetic field. This is not a small effect. It is a uh, factor of three. It is actually dominant. The other thing you note, ah, well, let's uh, go over this here. <clears throat> so what we uh, will claim now is happening here is that at low field, like here, we are really in the topological insulator mode. We have not reached the extreme quantum limit yet. We have conventional magnetoresistance, positive magnetoresistance, and we have a decrease in thermal conductance because of that. But when we get to the ultra quantum regime, and of course there's some thermal smearing, which explains why these lines smear out a little. When we get to ultra quantum regime, that is when we clearly have a positive, uh, an increase in thermal conductivity with uh, magnetic field, which we claim is the effect of this chiral energy unbalanced term that I explained in the beginning of my talk. Notice, of course, that 160 Kelvin and suddenly 200 Kelvin is much higher than the Dubai temperature, which is around 100 Kelvin. Uh, so we claim that this effect is actually quite insensitive to phonons. Um, the other thing, well, so the robustness of phonons and defects, the phonons I have actually shown you already, the defects. Now, we are experimentalists, we're not theoreticians. There are a couple of basic rules for experimentalists. One is you have to reproduce this on multiple samples, and that is what we did, six samples actually. And then if you think you have an effect, you have to show that you know how to make it go away. And of course, uh, the first proof on different samples is to try this on very low mobility samples, 20,000 instead of 2 million, and the effect is still there. It's a little bit smaller, but it's not that, it's not absent at all. And the temperature dependence is still there too. It is still a high temperature effect. 
These samples have relatively slower mobility. So I claim that we have the, uh, a good degree of robustness to defect scattering in the observations we have. And we have several such samples. Um, can we make the effect go away? Well, of course, if we plot, we put the magnetic field in the wrong direction where we don't form wild points, we have no effect. And we also don't have a, a, a grad T dot B term here. We only have a grad T cross. Um, and the other thing that I already showed you is if we take a sample that is not a wild semi-metal, but a conventional semi-metal with trivial pockets at T points, there is no such effect. If we do the rest of the experiment, we do the same longitudinal magneto resistance, there is no effect. <clears throat> so we think that the effect is really correlated with the wild state of the material. Angular dependence, I show that here, it's quite sharp. It's much sharper than the simple sinusoidal dependence on the angle between the magnetic field and the current flow, the heat flow. It's something like a cosine n to the power, maybe six or some such number. <clears throat> now, let me uh, then show you here temperature dependence and length dependence. These are samples of different lengths and the temperature dependence thereof. So this is simply the slope, VKDH at seven Tesla. You see that the temperature dependence is pretty much the same. There is no monotonic dependence on length. This is just sample to sample reproducibility. Uh, let me then take a little bit <clears throat> further in the analysis of this temperature dependence. And I will try to convince you that the decay with temperature that we observe is solely due to the excitations, the thermal excitations of carriers from one wild point to the other wild point and not to phonons or uh, anything else. So here is the analysis I will walk you through. We take one of these curves, dkdh, and uh, we have then an experimental dkdb at seven Tesla uh, taken as function of temperature. We take the formula I showed you in the beginning for the anomalous heat conduction, and we take its, and its field derivative dkdb is then, if the theory is right, something like this, where the Fermi velocity kbh by a linear in t, and then this time, which uh, we need to demonstrate <clears throat> is related to the interwild point, uh, trend, the, the, the thermal excitations between the wild points. Well, so we compare the data and the, and the, th and the model, and out comes only one parameter tau, which we plot here as a function of one over t. And so you see the tau values are here for the 15% sample and here for the 11% sample. And then uh, we make two analyses of this. First, we look at the low temperature limit, so high one over T. Um, and here is uh, 10, 12 seconds, and 10 minus 12 seconds, and 3, 10 minus 12 seconds. Uh, these numbers we can then compare to the scattering time we get out of the mobility at zero field. And they are 10 times larger than the scattering time at low temperature. Uh, so that is one observation. The second observation is we can draw a line through these uh, data and then fit that line to an activation energy model, tau is tau naught E activation over KT. Um, and out of this, we get activation energies, 34 millivolt here and 15 millivolt for these two concentrations. Let me put them here, 11%, 15%, 34, 15 with air bars. And we go back to the bad structure calculations of uh, Michael Fratain at seven and a half Tesla. Since we know the band parameters, what would be the band overlap? So basically the bandwidth of the wire bands. And the answer is here 35 millivolt and here 20 millivolt. So we think we, for two, two concentrations, we can have a very good correlation between the activation energy of the scattering time and the bandwidth meaning that essentially the bandwidth is what would determine here the thermal activation of the scattering time. In other words, the way the system decays is by electrons being thermally excited from one wild point to another wild point and not mediated by phonons or such things. Uh, which also means, of course, 
So tau is the intervalic point scattering time by, uh, by thermal activation. And the only energy scale therefore in the problem, which is this activation energy, is really the width of the wild bands, the band width here. Now it is under these circumstances that the scattering time should be the same for electrical and thermal measurements. And it is under these circumstances, mu equals zero and the same scattering time that the Riemann front is expected to hold. And here comes the hard part of the talk, which is the verification of the Wiedemann Franz law. Uh, like I said, the measurements up to here have taken a little less than a year. The second with the last fourth of the talk has taken 18 months. <clears throat> so let me show you an experimental verification of the Wiedemann Franz law, uh, which is really headache for two reasons. One is, the Wiedemann Franz law relates the electronic thermal conductivity to the electrical conductivity. But we have to now make this isolate this kappa E very carefully from kappa L. <clears throat> so there is a great opportunity to make small mistakes in this subtraction. Kappa minus kappa L should give us kappa E. Uh, so that is the first problem. The second problem is all the difficulties in measuring the electrical, the chiral anomaly, the real chiral anomaly, the negative magnetic resistance. So the prediction uh, from that theory if, is that if inelastic relaxation rate is related to the helicity, to the inter, inter wild point scattering, then we expect L equals L naught. If there are other inelastic relaxation mechanisms, of course, we would expect L to be smaller than L naught. Uh, and with polar conduction, I have supplemental slides you can ask, but if that were the case, then we would have L larger than L naught. There is another theory, chiral zero sound, uh, which also predicts L much larger than L naught. I'm not going to do theories, I'm just going to show you the experiments. Okay, so, we already showed uh, the separation at zero field, kappa into kappa lattice and kappa electronic. If I take this kappa electronic and I take the resistivity at zero field for the same sample, I can calculate, putting here the free electron value, what the Wiedemann Franz law should be. And that is the dashed line in this plot. By my book, this dashed line reproduces the data quite well. Yes, the Lorentz number is probably a little bit lower at, the, at zero field uh, at room temperature. And that's probably because the scattering time for the inelastic scattering time uh, for electrons is different from the momentum scattering time. It's a little bit shorter. So that, that we can reasonably explain. Now, let me point out one experimental difficulty we have at low temperature. Below 50 Kelvin, uh, the error bias on thermal conductivity are here. The lattice is here. So the difference between lattice and total is really within the error bar. So when we make that subtraction between the total and the lattice, we end up with an electronic, but it is imbued with a very large error bar. And of course, below 50 Kelvin, that error bar becomes so large, there's just no way we have accuracy on the determination of the electronic thermal conductivity. So measuring the wiedemann franz law, verifying the wiedemann franz law is impossible if we for below 50 Kelvin. Let me show what would happen if we were to force this through a zero field measurements, but we know wiedemann franz holds. Well, the simple straightforward subtraction gives us the blue points. The wiedemann franz law would give us this dashed line. We would, if we were to take the ratio of these two things that are close to zero, we would end up with a number that is much, much larger than L0, but that is completely wrong. That is entirely within the error bar. So this measurement is impossible below 50 Kelvin. Um, and now we have something I already alluded to before, which is the error due to the geometrical magneto resistance. So the distortion of the current lines. Um, this is very old this was identified in 1954. And here is a measurement on indium antimonide of the resistance, magneto resistance, geometrical magneto resistance due to distortion of current lines um, on Corbino disks and on then samples with length to width ratios 0 0.3, 10, and so on and so on. And you see that you have a geometrical effect that scales as one plus a geometrical factor mu squared d squared. I give you these geometrical factors in this little mobile, in this little plot here, uh, as a function of length to width ratios, a square sample, 
0.28 would be the prefactor you put here. Now, let me point out first and foremost that we can use this to get an idea of the error by, but we cannot use this to correct our data quantitatively because this model is, of course, extremely primitive. Um, for one thing, we uh, have a mobility that's probably field dependent, besides which we cannot define the mobility because we don't have a mass. It's a, a concept we don't have in wild semi-metals. We only have a velocity and a scattering time. So this model really doesn't apply and we cannot use it to do any physics with, but we can use it to get the order of magnitude of the error by and the order of magnitude, whether it's 1% or factor of thousand is all that really matters. But if we were to take this in our samples with a point with 700,000 mobility at 60 Kelvin, uh, one Tesla transverse, and we don't have a transverse, of course, would give this geometrical effect to be 1,400, 140,000%. So you see that would overwhelm everything. Now, um, let's take a little look more in the geometry we have. We really don't have the field perpendicular to the plane. We have the field parallel to the current, but we have a small misalignment angle theta. So then I can use that previous approximate formula um, to calculate my error bar on my resistivity measurement. And that would be the geometrical factor in mu square b square sinus theta. So now uh, the sample at 700,000 uh, mobilities at 60 Kelvin, give it one degree of misalignment, make it square. How much is the error? Well, 200%. Uh, furthermore, the... Uh, uh, mobility and business scales with t to the minus two, it goes in square here. So the temperature dependence of this error is a t to the minus four, which means that you have almost an order of magnitude more error at 35 Kelvin than you have at 60 Kelvin. Um, let me give you an example of what happens when we try to do things a little bit wrong on the samples that we use for thermal conductivity. So here is the same 8911 sample that I showed you the data on for thermal conductivity. Its dimensions were 3.5 by 1.4 by 1.6 millimeters, but the resistance, the current, the voltage contacts were about in the middle of the sample. Uh, this is the width. So we had the length to width ratio here of about one to one. And we had a misalignment of 3.8, which our error bar formula would give us an error at nine Tesla of a factor of 400. Um, well, look at what we observe. We have no negative magneto resistance at all. We have a strong positive magneto resistance at six Tesla by a factor of 50. Um, so that is completely extrinsic. That is just due to the misalignment of the sample. Uh, if, on the other hand, we take the same sample, we cut it down, we cut it very narrow, we put the length to width ratio now on the order of three to one instead of one to one, and we keep the misalignment at 0.15 degrees. The error we estimate from this little formula is now 25%. And uh, now we see the negative magnetic resistance that's supposed to be the signature of the chiral anomaly. <clears throat> but still, the error bar is still on the order of a substantial fraction of the measurement. Um, so what is the influence of the measurement errors on the determination of the Lorentz ratio? Well, if we underestimate the lattice contribution, which is easy to do, uh, then you would greatly overestimate the Lorentz ratio. If we had current jetting, and we don't, because we did everything that uh, the Kava group said to do, of one on group said to do, we then have a Lorentz number that would be lower than L0. But if we have an MR contamination, we will end up with gigantic Lorentz ratios, which are really fictitious. They're really due to extrinsic measurements, extrinsic magneto resistances that are contaminating the measurements of the chiral anomaly because of the slight misalignments in the sample. So then, after having broken a large number of samples and having highly frustrated the graduate student, Zong, who did these measurements, after 18 months of work, we managed to get one sample cut with a length to width ratio of 7.5 to one. And uh, then the samples have to be etched. The sides have to be etched. If you have slight ripples on the sides of the sample, that too gives you a geometrical magnetoresistance. It's another story, but it can also create errors. 
And then the samples were mounted with using goniometers and guides, and we have the accuracy uh, of the mounting within less than one, less than 0.1 degree, which really is within the error of the goniometer now. And so our little error estimation routine then gives us a 60 Kelvin, an error that is of the order of 5%, certainly seven, less than 7%, 7% 7 would correspond to this, which is a worst case scenario. And then he managed to measure on the same sample, the resistivity and the thermal conductivity so that we can now make a direct one-to-one -one comparison, this to that and get the Lorentz ratio. We do that here. <clears throat> So at two magnetic field values of so five Tesla and nine Tesla, you take the points for various temperatures. You subtract the lattice, which of course adds to the error by, as I have shown before, and you multiply by the resistivity. You then divide this by the free electron Lorentz ratio here and temperature, and you get the data points that I show here for the two temperatures, for the two uh, magnetic fields as function of temperature. So to verify the, Lee, the Riemann Franz law, you really need to verify two things. You have to verify that you have a constant Lorentz ratio, which, you know, are the points horizontal? Well, yes. And you verify whether or not the constant is equal to the free electron value by square root of three K over E squared. And I think this plot tells you that the answer is yes. Now we have to cut the, uh, the sample at 50 Kelvin for the errors that I explained. Below 50 Kelvin, we have a prohibitive error on the difference between electronic and lattice byte. And of course, we also have a steadily increasing error on the resistivity because the geometrical magnitude resistance shows up as well. So the error bars become of the same magnitude as the measurements if we go below 50 Kelvin and this becomes meaningless. And uh, with that, I'm 10 minutes before the end, and Heidel told me that I had to keep my talk to about 50 minutes, so there we are. I showed you the chiral anomaly in wild semi-metals. That is, of course, what happens when you have the electric field parallel to the magnetic field, and I showed you this in the bismuth antimony system. Uh, I showed you that there exists a thermal equivalent uh, when you have grad T, to be, but it's not really the same thing at all. It's not a change, it's not a creation and annihilation of carriers between the two wild points, creation and annihilation of energy. I showed you that when mu equals zero, it's supposed to be related by the Wiedemann Franz law, and that we think we have experimental proof that it is. I hope to convince you that the bismuth antimony alloys are ideal topological insulators at low field and ideal wild semi metals in the high magnetic field, not the trigonal direction. And I hope to have convinced you that we have seen a thermal version of the chiral anomaly. It's very large, 300% of the electronic part. It's robust against phonons, it's robust against defects, and it's governed by only one energy scale, and that is the width of the wild mass. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody. I guess hands up to, to, uh, uh, to thank um, very wonderful talk and uh, results, the very nice results. Um, so uh, people have not been writing in the Q&A questions directly, but maybe I could ask now uh, who has some questions maybe to uh, lift your hand up and then I'll, uh, I'll uh, give you the, uh, the microphone. I think, uh, let's see, uh, let me ask uh, Tobias. Uh, let me allow to, okay, I think you've now, yeah, yeah go ahead and tell. Uh, Thank you, first of all, very much for this uh, beautiful and clear talk and the very nice results. Um, I have a question on this um, um, estimate for the error on the uh, resistivity that you showed. How much does that depend on uh, the precise nature of the electronic state? So whether you're in a, a vial semi-metal state or in any other state? No, it really depends. It, it was initially found in 1954 on a classic semiconductor and type in diamantimonide. So it's completely in a, in a completely diffusive regime. It is totally general. It's a macroscopic effect. It's just the current lines that get distorted. But it holds in general when you have a strong, when omega C tau is much larger than one, this will dominate your measurements. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, let's see, I think, hang on a second, I have to have, no, oh, uh, okay, 
let's have uh, Pablo. Uh, can you ask your question now? I think uh, if you unmute yourself, yeah. Yes. Uh, hello. Yes. Thank you very much for your nice talk. I have uh, as a naive question. Uh, is it possible to somehow quantify the anomalous thermal hole effect, which will be induced by the <laughs> operation of wild nodes? It's right to do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, that's my next talk. Uh, so uh, in the slides here, if time permits, contrast electrical and thermal hall effects. Uh, so we do see a very clear signature of uh, in thermal hall. The thermal hall is very large, um, but that is a completely separate talk. Oh. Um, and I, I don't think that if I'm given six minutes, I cannot do it justice. Also, it's unpublished. It's going to come soon. Okay. But the answer is there is a very, very clear signature in the in the thermal hall. Yes. Yeah, I think they would come together. I mean, I don't think you would have one effect and not the other. Um, let me see. Uh, I think we have also Gisela. Uh, uh, Gisela, uh, can you go ahead and ask your question? Yes, a bit low. You have to speak a little louder, maybe. Uh, so I have a question concerning the crystal quality. Do you uh, have an idea or measured how in your perfect crystals the defect density is and how this varies probably from sample to sample? Yes. Well, we our main measurement here is a mobility measurement at low field. And so uh, the mobility in our best sample was 2 million, and in our worst samples, which are Sokralski grown, uh, is 20,000. Mm -hmm. I think that that gives you right away an idea of uh, the, 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 the scale by which we can affect the defect. Now, one should point out that we use two techniques. Uh, one, Axokratsky samples uh, <clears throat> that are actually very, very old. Uh, they come back from my own PhD thesis, <laughs> grown in the 1960s, 1968 to be exact. And um, you don't have to confess, Josh. <laughs> and uh, these samples, uh, the, the, the bad samples are mine, and the good samples, my students. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, and they were the bad samples were made by Sokrasi, the good samples were made by a traveling molten salt method. It's a technique that um, uh, uh, one of Bob Kava's old postdocs, Hor, H O I, taught us how to use. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ali Reza, uh, can yeah. you go ahead and ask a question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just a nice question about uh, the S slide that you show about transition from TI to while same at all. By increasing the magnetic field. I'm wondering that uh, uh, this is a thickness dependence as well. Is there any critical thickness? Uh, for yeah, this there is. So there probably is, you're, you're right. <clears throat> I mean, there almost certainly is because we do know that there is a very strong size effect in these materials and there is a, a whole, well, in fact, we, we made a study of this uh, in the 1990s of the thickness and the size dependence of transport in bismuth nanowires. But in this particular but, case, uh, is it really 3D? Yeah? It's... In this particular case, the samples are millimeters and centimeters long. Oh, so okay. we do not have, we, we looked for it. I have a view graph where I show you the difference, uh, the results on, the, on samples of different sizes. Um, but of course, in the millimeter range, you don't really expect anything and you don't see anything. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Matthias, uh, you're going to mute yourself and ask yeah. a question. Hey, th thanks for this really nice talk. Um, I have a question concerning the importance of the charge carrier density. So you mentioned that you have very low charge carrier density in your samples, like 10 to the 15 per cubic centimeter or something like that. So maybe you can comment a little bit where the residual charge carriers come from and you know what happens. Oh. Or for instance, are the bad, do the bad samples have much higher charge carrier densities? Uh, oh, oh, so the, the charge carrier density primarily comes from the purity of the static material. So the question is how good bismuth and how good antimony can you buy on the market? And you can buy six nines, but when you calculate uh, with commercial material, you can get the charge carrier density not below 1017 by freezing it out. Uh, 
Okay. So in reality, we zone refine the material in-house before we use it for growing crystals. And it's the only way to get to 1015. The, the, the best commercial stuff will give you 1017. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so you, you have to make in-house uh, purifying for the materials to get to that low number because it is quite low. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But it's not difficult to do. I mean, I don't do it. Zone did it. My students do it. But... Um, but uh, he can tell you how difficult it is. Not difficult, but it it's has more to like be the pressure. Yeah, if you can do this also for targets, if you want to make thin films, if you also need that, you know, very very oh, high yeah. purity for the targets, and if you cannot buy this commercially, we come back to you. Oh yes, this is absolutely necessary. Um, the main impurity that you have in commercial bismuth is lead, and lead will dope it p-type. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you see, even with us, uh, the, the, the sample flips is very, very slightly p-type. Okay. But instead of 1017 p-type, it's 1015 p-type. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Uh, okay, Christian, you have a question? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I'm not quite sure if this question is uh, in your expertise, but a while back there was, there was a paper on the gravitational anomaly, which <laughs> also took vile semi-metals and uh, looked at thermal response basically and uh, i don't have all the details in in uh, in my mind right now but they it sort of looks similar perhaps if you're aware of that work can you contrast your your findings with theirs yes yes i'm quite aware of that work we <clears throat> we've, we've had to deal with the referee uh, who is likely in the audience today um so the truth is that I do not really understand the gravitational anomaly, uh, but what I can tell you for sure is that there is an extremely well-written and easy to understand paper by Luttinger in the 1950s. Uh, <clears throat> and that paper uh, makes the following argument. So you uh, have the Boltzmann equation where, of course, uh, heavily depend on statistical distribution functions to solve for your transport properties. But in electrical transport, you also have a Kubo formalism and you can do, you, there is a way to put the electric field into a Hamiltonian and solve this much more rigorously, <clears throat> resulting mostly for our purposes as experimentalists in the same answer. Now, Luttinger then writes a paper uh, well, so then the same does not work for temperature gradients, which you can't put in the Hamiltonian. Luttinger then writes this 1954 paper where he says, well, but you can represent uh, the temperature gradient as a uh, function of, as a gravitational gradient, as a function of, uh, as a gravitational thing that you can put in the Hamiltonian, <clears throat> sort of a vector potential. And then you can, solve this whole transport thing rigorously using gravitational uh, gradients, uh, which then puts the name gravitational to all these thermal transport properties. Um, I know there is a group at the University of Madrid in Spain that says, no, it's much more than a formal analogy. It is, uh, uh, but the formal analogy is something that I can understand. And if, if we go by the formal analogy, then I would say that what we see really is not that different um, from uh, a gravitational anomaly. We just use a different name. Now, the main difference in experiment, from an experimental point of view is the relation to the wiedemann franz law. And uh, we most definitely are positive that we have a Lorentz ratio uh, that is equal to the free electron value, which fits with a simplistic theory, much more simple than the gravitational theory, that I started my talk with. Um, that's as much as I can say about this. Good, thank you. Maybe I can comment a little bit. I mean, it is a, not more than an analogy. I mean, it's essentially what uh, Glutinger does is uh, create a photogravitational field and the opposing gradient and uh, that's the equilibrium position and then you take that off and that's the thing that uh, component so it's, it's exact actually but this uh, analogy was really uh, what you observe I mean it's not any maybe just as acute uh, to call it gravitational but it has nothing to do with gravitation it's still the thermal gradients you know <laughs> it was just the selling thing uh, as far as I can tell
Um, okay, let me ask uh, Switchy. But, but um, to add to that, I think there is really no difference between the measurements. I think we see the same thing. It's a question. Yeah, it's just a matter of interpretation, but it's just a simply uh, associating the gravitational gradient with the gravitation or the thermal gradient, but this is formally exact in certain limits, particularly in the limits of no interacting system, which is what you have here, as you demonstrate by the ratio that you observe. Um, so there's no, you know, you can call it uh, tomatoes, tomatoes, it still is uh, the same thing, um, at least from my, my understanding, yeah, I, I, would, I, should, uh, I should say. Yeah, the, this uh, is so, too. Yeah, I, th I don't think I think we what we see is the same thing. Yeah, you know, there is a discrepancy, of course, in the Lorentz ratio, but that is another matter, and I, I stand by our data. That's that's yeah. where we are. Uh, Suichi, uh, you have a question? Would, okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, okay, uh, so thank you very much for the beautiful talk. And uh, yeah, uh, I understand that uh, uh, you used a field induced uh, wire. Yes, in matter, but uh, uh, can you, uh, in principle, do it uh, with a uh, usual uh, wire symmetry in zero field, or it's a matter of uh, a high mobility uh, that you use the bismuth antimony, so that uh, it, it is not easy for usual wire symmetry? Um, <clears throat> okay, so yes, you can. Uh, so there are data on tantalumarsenide, and they then show a very small effect, some change, uh, uh, an increase in thermal conductivity with thermal, uh, with magnetic field, longitudinal magnetic field, but a few percent, whereas we see 300%. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's really a matter of mobility because our data are not really mobility dependent within a factor of 100. I think what matters most is to get the chemical potential right at the wire point. I see. Because the tantalum isonite has, has all these trivial pockets and mm -hmm. there's still some wild physics that transpire, then that transpires when mm -hmm. you have the chemical potential deep in the band, but it's not nearly as clear as when you put the chemical potential at the wild point. Ah, ha, ha, ha. I see. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Switchy. Uh, is there any other quest last questions? Uh, there was some about 3D uh, systems if somebody wants to ask it, but I need to have a hand up. Okay. Okay. Uh, it doesn't seem to. Bart, do you have any questions yourself? <laughs> no, I guess not. Um, so I think with that, uh, we finished. Uh, I hope everything was clearly answered, uh, particularly for the <laughs> referee, <laughs> as I'm convinced. Um, I found it, the whole thing very convincing. Thank you, uh, Jos. That's what's beautiful experiment and uh, beautiful results, actually. I uh, really enjoy that. Uh, very thorough. You have a very, very good students, very devout uh, <laughs> set of students during these COVID times. Um, uh, so if anything else, I wish uh, the rest of you a good rest of the week. Uh, please stay safe. And uh, next week, please join us uh, with like Oleg Stock. Okay. Okay. That, Thank you very much. Colin. Thank you very much for being able to speak here. And yeah. And on the stream now. So thank you. Uh, Josh, that was great. That was uh, really nice.